good. We're rolling. You know, I think what you want to do, because Trillia's not sure what she might want to do. So, Lord G, if you can hit in the middle for me tonight. We're just going to take it on a little bit until our guests come, and then we're going to just transition. Ed, you want to come on up? Or you feel like? No, you don't. Know. What? You're going to just lay down for me? Okay. I can come down. Logging in with us here live on Facebook. So, I thought we might talk about a couple hot topics tonight, right? I mean, you know, just until we get our show going and our other guests get okay. in, you know. So, I have a question for you. Oh, we're not ready yet. I okay. am really tripping, guys. Dante, I'm not Did you? <laughs> Do I have a Willie down here? I get all discombobulated for you. to the Poetry Justice Show with Jackie Ray Phillips here on yikesradio.com. Now here on the Poetry Justice Show, this is where social consciousness meets the eyes. And what we do is we select topics that spark the interest and awareness of social diversity, ranging from arts, entertainment, and social justice at large, leaving our listeners thinking and saying, yikes! Yikesradio.com. Now those were the sultry sounds of my mentor, the Mr. Kevin Nash. Now you know Kevin Nash is the owner of this proprietorship here at Accelerated Radio and Yikesradio.com. So I always like to give homage and respect to him because it's an honor to be dubbed as the Queen of Yikes Radio. <sighs> 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 So anyway, guys, and then we're also on AccelerateredRadio.net, and we also want to make sure that we give uh, that a shout out and my sponsorship. This is the juicy fun time. The sponsorship here is I give hats off to my benefactor, Miss Lori Ray Fisher, Lori G of the chat, and owner of Gingy Productions and Entertainment Company. And then I also give a shout out to my big guy, WMPJ Steelworks and APS Muscle Bar. So thank you guys so much. So guys, we are here again. It's another Saturday night. We've got a lot of callers, and listeners already on Facebook streaming. Praise be to God. I thank everybody so much for tuning in. Hey, Roddy Rod and Ricky and the Time to Russell hey, and Miss Frida Ross and Jeez Navish. We got a we're a pretty good audience going on tonight, everybody. So Dante, I'm gonna give this to you. Did you do what you do? Hello, Miss Miner. Oh my God! Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Me and my sister gonna rearrange it just a tad. Just a tad. Okay. Yes, just a tad, so we can catch and capture that beautiful voice. How are you tonight? I'm good. I'm very good. You're you guys. Everybody else is good. Okay. Yeah. yeah we're okay. Good. We're we're good. 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 I have a question for you. When you hear the word homelessness, what do you think? I instantly think of just really sad, like someone who possibly didn't have a choice, maybe even. Okay. If you go both ways, some do have a choice and some really don't have a choice of the circumstances they go against for them to fall into their poverty. Right. You know. Exactly. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes, Lloyd, uh, I, your choice is because... Right, Ms. Miner is saying about choices some mm-hmm. people did, did not. What do you take that? I do, I, I agree that there are sometimes choices, sometimes no choices, mm-hmm. right? Um, what I immediately think about, not immediately, but one thing, immediately I think I agree with you, I think of sadness, because we're at epidemic levels, which we're gonna talk about tonight, mm-hmm. uh, and that's very sad, but I also think about mental that's mm-hmm. a word that comes to mm-hmm. mind for me mm-hmm. when I hear homelessness. And I think that buys into, as you were saying, some of the choices, but some of the non-choices, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think as we, we look back and we'll have, you know, 
our illustrious Miss Ross yes. over here way in. But all the way back with Ronald Reagan, when he shut down the mental health um, facilities mm -hmm. and putting funding there, I think that was probably the cusp of individuals mm -hmm. being funneled into the uh, prison system yes. and pathways that led to homelessness. Great, have you, um, in your work, have you heard of anything of the subject? Is there, is, are there still any like trending practices or anything regarding the notion? Any mm -hmm. trending practices you know. regarding the notion of sure mental health, mental leading health, to mental to health leading to homelessness? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the changes in the Reagan administration yeah. that sought that out as kind of the yeah the um, the, the changes are are very pronounced and profound now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And it's kind of almost, um, they kind of are kind of going hand in hand for the most part, mm -hmm. that the whole, you know, mental health issues with coupled with homelessness, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, even if you didn't suffer from a mental health disorder prior to becoming homeless, you have to know that that's a traumatic experience which could cause PTSD, mm -hmm. um, severe depression, you know, right. things of that nature. So yeah, it's, um, but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> we're working know, one on thing it. I, um, I think recently came into my level of awareness, and I think that was the previous panel here on the TLJ show. Oftentimes when we think of homelessness, we think of what we see maybe a little more overtly, right? Yeah. So you're seeing people that are in tents or they're alongside mm -hmm. the freeway. But there, there are also other people that you are working with every yep. day. Mm -hmm. Our children that you're yep. teaching every mm -hmm. day mm -hmm. um, that really are victims of homelessness. Mm -hmm. So homelessness, in my opinion, doesn't have just one face. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. it doesn't. You'd right. be surprised. Yeah, you will. Right. You would be surprised, really. Yeah. At the numbers, the children, you know, and I've been working in the field for a really, really, really long time, but it wasn't until just here in the last, I'd say, three years when I started working downtown, mm -hmm. you know, because homelessness in Santa Monica is different from homelessness on Skid Row, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, I hadn't seen the kids, and I can remember vividly the first morning that I did, and it was a lady, she was combing her little girl's hair, sitting outside the tent, getting her ready for school. And it, um, oh God, it, it just, it wore really heavy on me. You know, it, not that I didn't know that this was a real epidemic, but it just became so very real. Personal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to me, seeing that, you know, having a little girl and, and, and not at even being able to imagine, right? Absolutely. Having to, to fight that kind of a fight, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but that's that's what she was doing. She was getting the babies ready for school, sitting outside of their tent. Yeah, and it just, yeah. Oh, uh, I see what this is, Mina. Where are you going? Oh, because I work with kids. You know, I work with uh, children like two years to four years old. And so mm -hmm. being with them like 24 7 like that, you know, I consider them, I don't have kids myself, I consider them my own. Yeah. And just to think of that because it's like, that kind of not really sets the tone for that child's life, but you know, you know, the, the, hmm. for that child possibly to wake up every day not know if they're going to eat, you mm -hmm. know, they got to be ready for school, mm -hmm. probably tired, and they're going through a struggle in class, trying to focus, and that can lead them into like another little pattern. Oh, possibly not even not saying mm -hmm. that child may fail school, they might push them harder to go harder in school. But it could also affect their grades, all type of stuff, you know, and then that sets the tone for that child leading into adolescence, mm -hmm. adulthood, and then. Mm -hmm. It might be an ongoing cycle, possibly, yes. or possibly not. Right, right. right. It might right. make them stronger. But it's just sad to know because, you know, that child doesn't have a choice. Uh, to get put in that situation. And we don't know what probably happened with the mother for them to get in that situation. So, yeah, that's just like, mm -hmm. you know. That's yeah. good. If you, we, because it trickles down to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're saying, not, you know, how do you focus in school? You being an educator. Well, you don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, and I think what happens is that there um, needs to be more, I know there is an onset, but more sensitivity training mm. for teachers, for mm -hmm. educators, because oftentimes we label JoJo as a bad actor mm -hmm. in our class, right? Mm -hmm. But 
we don't always know what JoJo has endured mm -hmm. before he or she even arrives in school, you know? And then I think in this day and age, um, social media can be your friend, but it can also be young people's enemies. So you children oftentimes run around carrying the fear that someone may know my mother combs my hair in the tent mm -hmm. outside of where we're homeless. Mm -hmm. And that would be so detrimental if, to my little life if right. someone put that on Facebook. Yeah. Or they put that on Instagram or Snapchat and on and on and on, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just multi-layered. I think another thing is that oftentimes for some children, those school meal programs are the only places those children can exactly. count on eating. Right. You know? right. So they don't have the proper nutrition every day mm -hmm. that can actually lend to successful brain development mm -hmm. and the opportunities for learning. There's no place to do your homework. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you have an established area? How can you even sit in the class mm -hmm. and be an effective listener mm -hmm. when you know when you leave there mm -hmm. where you're going? It's um, so. Do are we looking at? Give me some, I'm trying to look at jot this down. So mm -hmm. like, are we looking at? Remember, like I put in the ad, who are we? Like as a country, mm -hmm. as a people, like who are we? Mm -hmm. And the, exactly. the camps are just getting larger and larger and bigger and bigger. So are we going to create a new normal? A new society of language? How we see the encampments are growing larger and larger, like creating little, with all due respect, communities. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Just like you have a housing, your housing community, if you will. Mm -hmm. right. You got it because you, right, and, but they're just growing in yeah, terms growing, of growing. density and normality. Yeah, That's, I think, the problem, though, is that we as a society Hi. are growing insensitive right, to the level of sensitivity is trending toward this is our normality. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. absolutely, which is scary for us. As, as a society, people, as right. a people. Well, guys, you know how we do here in the show. Yes, have a ride. Right. Yes. <laughs> 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 you think we should leave it there or leave it there? We're going to leave it there. Okay, hi, how are you guys doing? I'm going to just get up a little bit, everybody. We're going to move around. I do have our very special guest. You can have some rain from our guests in here. So Stanley Burchett, he's a friend. Um, he says he's work, he works in the field as well. He says, I just placed a 20-year-old mother with her two-year-old daughter into a motel just last night, mm -hmm. sitting at Union Station with nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. He says, all my gangster went out the window. Wow. You know what I mean? It, it, it just has a... Yes, uh, I'm going to give this to the Lord. And a quick free to roll. <laughs> on, on, you guys on you, right? When you see that... Hey, Amber. Hey, Mark. I'm so glad that you guys are here. Thank you. Right? Yes, I'm really happy to be here. This is good. Yeah. I love the setup. I work for these wonderful people. Yeah. Oh, you guys got water? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. This is yours. I you apologize. Have a crowd here. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody's happy. We're going yeah. to stay going. But welcome, welcome so much to the Poetry of Justice Show. Ha. There you go. Yeah, we're back, huh? Okay. Yeah, back so, so again, I welcome Marcus and Oprah, and Executive too. Director of Homeless Health Care Los Angeles, oh, yeah. as well as well, Emma Roth, Director oh, okay. of Programs and Operations, oh, and Operations oh, okay. also okay. of Homeless Health Care Los Angeles. And do you see it? Thank you. We're so happy to be here. Mm -hmm. You made it. Was that LA traffic wild? It was. Yeah, a little misdirection in our our map quest there. I know. I've had I, I've had guests. It happened to other guests. So it gets crazy sometimes with the traffic and everything. But thank you so much for making it tonight. And we're going to be talking homelessness. 
so what I do have in the house and I just thought I'd let you know so you can kind of get a feel for it. I have um, the lovely Shelly C. Shelly is a member of the chat. Let me give you a little bit of history of the show and then we'll dive in deeper and allow you guys to get your thoughts and get it together, mm -hmm. and, you know, mentally. And so we do every third Wednesday. Every third, I'm sorry, Jesus. Every third Saturday mm -hmm. of the month, what we do, I do a segment called The Chat. And what it is, there are four ladies. And uh, what we do is we get together and we put our ideas together and we talk about different issues and topics and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so Shelly's of the chat, and so she wanted to be in the house tonight because homelessness is definitely something that's very dear and dear and passionate to her heart. And then behind us, I have the lovely Miss Minor and her mother, Miss Trillan, <laughs> Taylor Minor. And just to let you know the, the love and respect that we have here in the house, Trillan and I go all the way back to middle school together. So we've known each other a very, very long time. And so uh, it just social consciousness at, of all kinds and human kindness has always been something very spe special about this young lady, now a woman. And so I'm happy to have her hand cherry picked everybody for you <laughs> too here tonight. And then I have Angie Johnson Barbie in the house. <laughs> Angie and I also go back, uh, but just as far as Frida and I as well, which we go back to about mm -hmm. the age of three, you guys of knowing one another. And so mm -hmm. this is how deep the vines That's of right legacy yeah. of love flow. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure I brought an all star cast of love to bring to the table for us tonight. So. Yes, and then my lovely sister who is in the corner here, this is Lori Ray Fisher. <laughs> Lori Ray is the executive producer and she's also a contributor to the Poetry of Justice show. She is also the vice dean of um, theater and dramatic arts out of USC. Mm -hmm. So he, she helps bring that artistic side to the show as well. So we are going to get on the road. Mark Casanova, homelessness. What does that word mean to you? You know, I don't like labels, but I, okay. you know, that the latest is to talk about people experiencing it. So okay. I do say that, yeah, there are quite a few people in Los Angeles. We're the homeless capital of the world. So we have the most, and it's not a distinction that we, we should pride ourselves in. It's really a terrible thing that, yeah, close to, and, you know, depending on the study you look at or the count, it's close to 50,000 to 60,000 people on any given night are homeless in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. so it's, it's um, a, a sad state of affairs, but Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles addresses that issue, and I'm excited to talk about that today, but... Please um, do. Oh. Well, oh. There you do go. Do you? That's how we do here. Yeah. yeah. That's how you do it. Yes. Well, uh, I've been at it quite a while, so I've been with the organization for about 32 years, and uh, I was a youngster 32 years ago thinking I could solve all the problems of the world. I, I actually had been working at the Salvation Army as a uh, um, counselor, case manager type uh, in a family shelter. And uh, I heard about the group that I now uh, have been with for 32 years. And um, at the time, I thought pretty simple. It was the 80s, uh, find people a place to stay. And it seemed like a rather easy job that I took. but. After working there for a couple of years, I realized that um, it's a, a bit more complicated, so to speak, in how you move people from the streets and into housing, uh, given the kind of uh, situations that people find themselves in. Um, so I came aboard about 32 ago at Homeless Healthcare, and we've, we've really, uh, I think, done a great job of uh, shifting the thinking of, of the way in which we might look at doing the work but also addressing it in a meaningful way. You know, we, we do see a number of people every year, and I, I brought my coworker here, Amber, Amber Roth, and uh, Amber can actually probably uh, dive a lot deeper into the detail, but uh, what drew me into it is I, I, I'm a compassionate person that um, had really loving parents and just kind of did what they did, <laughs> help people. And uh, I got up every day, suited up, showed up, put one foot in front of the other, and lo and behold, 32 years later, boy, have we accomplished a lot. And mm -hmm. it has a lot to do with, I think, um, the mission that we've created. And for me personally, it's um, a mission that kind of rings home that uh, you accept people, or you meet them where they are, mm -hmm. and you um, give them, if they don't have hopes and dreams, you give them hopes and dreams, mm -hmm. and uh, purpose, 
because I think that's what got us up in the morning. That's what uh, creates the success we have is that purpose. I had a, a, a lot of people helping me and, uh, and just returning the favor, truthfully. I have been returning it for 30, 40 years now. And, uh, I, I'm not tired of it. I love it. Get up every day, go to work. It's a, a great job. I have great coworkers like Amber to work with and, and an awesome team. Frida's here. Yeah. Frida's yeah. in the house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, well, I'll stop there because I could yak on and on for a long time about homelessness. But yeah, there, well, there's the point. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know? Yeah. I mean, but no, I know it's not bad. And I'm going to let you. I told you we just go with the flow. You go with the flow. You're here. Yeah. You dealt with LA traffic. Of course, we want to hear. Well, let, let's uh, maybe let Amber set up the show here and, and uh, give you a picture of homeless health care and then maybe in a reverse way we can dive into just what homeless in, homelessness is and kind of how we might find ourselves out of this situation. Mm. That's good. All right. Cool. Thank you. And thank you for um, having us be here tonight. I'm very excited. And this is definitely a, a topic that um, that I'm very passionate about as well. I've been in the field for over 19 years. Um, and really, um, we were talking on our way down here. Whoops. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. How do we do this? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Okay. It's a different one. I was uh, talking, uh, we were talking about this on our way down here actually, and I think that how I kind of entered the field um, was really looking at, I, so I'm originally from Iowa and um, have a lot of addiction and mental health um, in our family. And so just wanting to really, um, and I saw how it is so hard for, for families to overcome those challenges. But one of the biggest things that really stood out to me was um, that if you don't have love and people that believe in you, that it can really destroy families. Um, and so I think a part of that just was planted early on in my life. And um, when I moved out to California and had the opportunity, that's what I wanted to do was to like make a difference or be a part of something bigger um, mm -hmm. to make a difference. And so seven years ago, being a part of homeless health care um, has just allowed me to continue that journey. Um, just to talk a little bit about homeless health care, we see over um, 26,000 unduplicated um, individuals um, annually. Um, so, and, and we're very proud of that in the sense that that means that 26,000 individuals trust us to come into our care, which is really powerful. Um, we do a variety of services. Um, we really focus on clients um, that are probably like some of the hardest to reach individuals. Um, a lot of them are experiencing um, chronic homelessness, come from our justice systems, um, come from, you know, using, um, are actively using substances, um, struggle with mental health conditions. So, you know, just some of the most vulnerable people that we see out on our streets and don't see on our streets. Um, we offer, um, the unique thing about homeless health care that Mark was mentioning um, about harm reduction and just kind of embracing people and, and loving them and creating an unconditional um, love type environment is all about social connections and, and creating those opportunities to build those connections. So we start by doing straight outreach. We have a team, um, a multidisciplinary team that is, um, you know, uh, medical staff, um, mental health specialists, substance use specialists, housing navigators, case managers, and they go and reach um, the clients that are in, living in the tents, you know, living out underneath the bridges mm -hmm. and, and just try to build that human connection again and letting them know that they matter and how can we just support them. Um, so that's truly meeting people, you know, where they're at and, and, and their living conditions at this time. Um, and then as clients, you know, um, we kind of look at things in stages and as along, and we work with clients along the whole healing journey. And so clients kind of in the pre-contemplation stage, we think about like what kind of services can we bring clients that maybe aren't ready to stop using um, drugs or, you know, maybe they don't want to start taking their medication as prescribed by their mental health provider. Um, and maybe they don't even want housing at this point in time because that's really scary for them. Um, and so we created, you know, services just to, to bring them basic needs like hygiene products, um, food, water. Um, we have a very awesome um, Center for Harm Reduction in Skid Row, which is where we distribute syringes and clean supplies to clients that are actively using um, drugs. Um, we do a lot of overdose prevention and naloxone because our goal out there really is to save lives and, and to keep people safe. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, and just provide a level of dignity. 
Um, we also have a very cool um, spot in Skid Row called the Refresh Spot, um, which was a community-based um, initiative, and so it was developed by Skid Row residents, and they had a voice in, in the whole um, development of the program and the site, and they still do, and it's, and it just really is meeting clients, you know, providing that basic di dignity of giving um, access to restrooms, laundry facilities, and showers. And, and letting them feel, and just to watch how people completely transform their lives is pretty amazing. Um, and and the, that's one of our sites that's open 24 seven, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and then we have clients, you know, that are ready to start diving in and maybe going into action phase and mm -hmm. um, in, in the stages of change. And so those clients that do ready, you know, that want to take that next step, um, we have very intensive case management programs. Frida is very familiar with this. Our Housing for Health program is one of our largest housing programs. And that's where we really help clients transition from living on the street, um, getting them into some type of safe type of housing, maybe bridge housing or interim housing, um, and eventually into permanent housing. And then we do all of the stabilization and community support of services, going into the, um, doing home visits with them, budgeting, independent living skills, just anything that they need to thrive in their new environment. Um, so that's pretty um, amazing. And then we have a, a great um, outpatient um, mental health and substance use treatment program um, that we integrate with all of um, our clients that want those type of services. So as you can kind of see, and that's just kind of a, you know an idea of the menu of services that we offer depending on where the client's at and what journey they want to follow. Well, how can someone who needs services get in touch with the organization? Could you give us the handle so how people can do so? Yeah, yeah. So we have like a lot of different ways. So through outreach teams, um, if they do, um, if they're interested in learning more, they can go to our website, hhcla.org. Um, our main location is on Beverly, and that's um, 2330 Beverly Boulevard, and they can, we do take walk-ins there. Um, if they're clients in the Skid Row area and they are actively using substances, we really want to meet them, and they can come into our Center for Harm Reduction there. Do you have a caller, Amber? Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Are you ready to go? <laughs> that's Roddy Rod. Hey, Roddy Rod. How you doing? <laughs> we love you, Rod. Thank you so much. <laughs> you scamp. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rod. Do you have an opinion on that tonight, sir? What would you say to, do you run across, Amber, if you will, prideful? Do you, do you have you run across that in your work where sometimes individuals are a little stubborn to take the help? How would you address that? Um, I don't know if it's stubbornness. I think I think that is an important comment, though, the um, pride. I think okay. that um, a, no, a lot of times our clients share that they, um, you know, they've been invisible for so mm -hmm. long, and, um, and some of them, there's, you know, their families, they weren't able to ask for the support that they needed from their families due to, because of a little bit of pride. And, they, and this is coming from the client saying this. And I think, but the other piece is that they kind of want to do what they want to do um, to get the help, you know, um, where they're wanting to get the help from. Mm -hmm. um, I think it just takes time to build those connections. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes when, um, you know, when people want to be helpful, and it's hard because, you know, they just want to give, you know, their food or, you know, water. I, I even do it when I'm like driving sometimes at the at the freeway entrances, and um, and it's okay. It's just kind of like offering. And if they're like, no, I'm fine, then it's like, okay, great, thank you. And then, but I think the key thing is acknowledging them. Like sometimes it's just like a smile or um, asking them, hey, do you mind if I stop by next week and see you? And and that can really make a difference too. Um, but I think it's just letting people know because I think they've been a lot of times people. Um, in vulnerable situations have been let down so many times and so that trust isn't there so we just have to you know let them know that we do care and, and we want to build that trust again so they can hopefully let down whatever they're going through that's putting up that guard thank you so much yeah. Amber. i appreciate that so rod did you hear that answer coming directly yes 
<laughs> Thank you right. so much, Rob, for calling in to the show tonight. We totally appreciate you. So where are you, where's your head at tonight? Now, Mr. Casanova, where are you, I see the wheels. Like oh yeah, my wheels are always going mm -hmm. about things. I, I well, I, I, the pride question was an interesting one, but I, I think that there's many reasons why mm -hmm. people may or may not accept help or want help. And I, I to me, it, it, it typically just boils down to um, the right to housing, the right to services, and it's mm -hmm. not a privilege. So in our mm -hmm. society, we set it up that in order to get certain things, you get them by privilege. You just don't have them. And to me, housing should be just like water. We mm. provide it for everybody, mm -hmm. food for everybody. Right. They're just basic needs that uh, a rich society like ours could mm -hmm. actually um, do those things. You go to other parts of the world and they treat housing, healthcare, and other uh, basic services like that, where everybody has access. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges, is to live in a country like the United States that's driven by capitalism, and that the have and the have-nots, and we tend to parcel out resources uh, in a much different way than uh, and, and the right to shelter is actually a really big one. I think right now there's a big discussion in California mm -hmm. and um, throughout the U.S. In New York, they have a right to shelter. So they went about tackling the problem a bit differently than we did. And uh, because it, uh, people have a right to shelter, yeah. they have more uh, availability of those types of services. And they've done this for many, many years. Is so it legislative? It's what legislative, it? but it's, it's literally a... a a law. a law, okay. And we're 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 headed in that direction, and there's a lot of um, folks that aren't necessarily in support of that. Mm -hmm. and because it hampers the capitalistic. Well, it, it, a little bit of criminalization gets thrown into mm -hmm. here because you um, don't have the tools then mm -hmm. to move people around. So what we do in Los mm -hmm. Angeles, just uh, uh, mm -hmm. case in point, is uh, move people around. If a neighbor doesn't like them because mm -hmm. we have a, a response system mm -hmm. that is driven by phone calls to the city council or to mm -hmm. a politician they react to the problem and what typically happens is the problem is moved mm -hmm. because there aren't enough resources and not enough affordable housing mm -hmm. to actually move people into a either an emergency shelter or a, a, a permanent place mm -hmm. and so our response tends to be a, a, a reactionary one versus mm -hmm. uh, a well thought out right to shelter, meaning that everybody has the right, and when we don't, they then have the right to stay where they are. Right. And right. that, that to me, is one of the answers, is we have a lot of encampments. I know um, a lot of folks in, in our city are concerned because the encampments have been in certain locations for a long time, mm -hmm. and uh, that with them they bring, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a lot of public health issues. Yes. So our strategy should be a public health one. Accept the fact that we have these encampments, and let's move in the direction of making sure that there's trash cans and trash pickup mm -hmm. and lots of other good public health strategies, hand washing stations, mm -hmm. toilets, mm -hmm. and uh, it protects everyone. It protects the people right. living nearby, and it protects the folks that are having to live there. Mm -hmm. And but we just are not set up to think this way. We, mm -hmm. we you know, I, I believe people have a right to health care, they have a right to housing. Mm -hmm. Housing is health care. Move people off the street, their health's going to improve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. And I think too, because um, the city or the powers that be, if you will, they're so ill-informed, I believe, you know what I mean? What they don't understand is when they do that and they take the measures that they take to, to move people from one encampment and they go to another, is that they're creating more trauma Mm -hmm. to this population of people you know what I mean and especially to those that have been in a certain spot you know they're feeling safe there they they there's some light or mm -hmm. you know there's some some cover for them you know what I mean and then for someone to just come in the morning and just 
you know, like hose down everything and, and, and dump everything that they have. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It doesn't, it's, it's trauma. And that's another thing that's really, really good, which most organizations have moved into this particular um, area mm -hmm. of, of dealing with the situation, trauma-informed care. It's very important that we deal with this population of people from that perspective. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We don't want to do any more harm. And, and, and oftentimes, um, trauma is, is a reason. You know, people go and get help and they're, they're, they're talked about, they're, they're turned away. You know what I'm saying? So we're just, they're, they're being re-traumatized. So that makes them hard. It makes it hard for them to reach out as well, i found, and you've got them working in this field. So we have to be really mindful of that and get these people that um, have this power mm -hmm. to just become more knowledgeable about exactly what it is that it's going to take in order to really do something about this situation, you know? I love you, Frida. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah. That's right on, absolutely. We need to care about people yeah. and care about how we treat them. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. What have you found to be, why, like who we are as a people, why is that so difficult for, for us to provide basic human rights? Well, I think our priorities differ depending on who you're asking that question. Mm -hmm. I, um, there are many folks in this community that just do not have on their head any of these issues. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, uh, I do think we have a very compassionate society, though. Mm -hmm. I absolutely. My hope is that those folks that do have that level of care to to um, evolve, so to speak, this issue and, and make that kind of change we need to do mm -hmm. are are there. Mm -hmm. So I, I think giving a forum like this is great. Giving mm -hmm. people information that. Um, there are people out there. I, I believe there are. It's just um, we tend to hear more from those that that want to uh, not necessarily uh, create a solution to this problem. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's yeah. terrible. Just to follow up though on the on the public health issue, there's a group LA Can. They do great work in downtown. They have a a strategy called services not sweeps. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, moths not cops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love their mm -hmm. their uh, their mantra. You know, house keys, not jail keys. And yeah, I, I do yeah. think that we have uh, a situation where uh, we, we can radically change the way we view it just right. by doing some very simple public health strategies. And that's what homeless health care is all about, is public health, mm -hmm. the greater good. Yeah. If we can make change for an individual, it, it actually helps the community. It's a healthier community and a, a healthier outcome. It's definitely with trauma. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I see that the Center for Harm Reduction Syringe Exchange Tackle, the word choice, language. Do you know why the word tackle was chosen? Uh, no. That's yeah. a good question, but I do like that word. <laughs> I it, is a, yeah. it is a problem. I, I, the Center for Harm Reduction is about saving lives, truthfully. Mm -hmm. If I boil it into one mm -hmm philosophical. Mm -hmm. we're, we're reducing harm, so we're helping people not uh, uh, contract certain diseases, mm -hmm. certain communicable diseases, whether it's HIV, uh, hepatitis, uh, you know, by the safe exchange of supplies and the safe use of supplies. We're also saving lives because we hand out a wonderful drug called naloxone. Mm -hmm. It reverses an opiate overdose. And clearly, we have saved thousands of people's lives by putting that, by tackling that opioid mm -hmm. problem and addressing it in a meaningful way by putting a very simple drug that the paramedics use, naloxone, in the hands of our folks that are participating in the program, and they turn around and save someone's life. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I don't know what kind of dollar value you can put on yeah. someone's mm -hmm. life, but. You save one that seems like that should wow. be plenty. Wow. Uh, we've saved thousands. Wow. And uh, if that, yeah. So tackle, though, I, I don't have a definitive answer other than, uh, did you make up that word, Amber? Can I blame you? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think you, you just tackle it head on. You just tackle yeah. it head on. What are you going to do? Because it's right there. It's active, right? 
so you can't go like around it, you know, it's so hard, I can't get over it. You know, you know what I mean? You can't get around it, so you just like uh, my sister has been teaching her little grandson how to tackle that guy. And he's uh, about two and he goes, one, two, three, ha! And he just lunges at you. So uh, yeah, tackle, that's why I was thinking about that word. And it's kind of, you know, even though we, you know, we, we come from a perspective of, of harm reduction, meeting people where they're at, and mm -hmm. with the trauma-informed care, you know, we kind of handle the population of people that we serve as, as gingerly as we possibly can, but when you talk about the, the epidemic mm -hmm. itself, it, it we have to it, it <laughs> will tackle it with some sufficient yeah. force because it's it has gotten so out of hand. You know, you would have thought that years ago when this stuff first started coming up that all these brilliant minds would have done something to kind of get a hold of this you know and and, and and it seems so simple you know let's house the people and, and and i think about like you know we have these elections and these these whatever that's going on you know um and all the money that they're spending mm -hmm. right to run for this office or to run for that office and and I'm ju i just think sometimes because i'm you know me i'm always on cnn mm -hmm. and harassing president trump on <laughs> instagram and Twitter, it's like, do you know how many people could be affected in, in a positive way right. with just a fraction yeah. of the money, money that they're spending, you know, and, and, and those are the, that's the way that I look at things, you know, it, it's like, I, I, I just can't believe that nobody up there as brilliant as they are have, have, have realized this. Right. You yeah, know? you're right, Frida, I, I do think to me, there's a couple things we could do that radically could shift money mm -hmm. and even uh, the way in which people look at it. One is decriminalizing mm -hmm. things that we arrest people for mm -hmm. that are just simple behavior, mm -hmm. drug use, mm -hmm. that if we decriminalize and stop arresting mm -hmm. people, <laughs> because yeah. what happens is once they exit the justice system, mm -hmm. they That's often right. find themselves on the street yeah. and it, it just seems like a prevention strategy as well to stop arresting them yeah and right. then you don't have yeah. the exit you know it's mm -hmm. years ago we did a program with the LAPD and they wanted us to to go and meet some of the folks that had been jailed for uh, the petty kind of jaywalking and you know the quality of life kind of crimes mm -hmm. and the broken window thing they were after to fix the window so they we would go in and, and talk to folks, but um, they wanted us to have these outcomes that mm -hmm. the LAPD wanted to know if we uh, uh, could ensure that by meeting with folks that they were gonna turn their life around when mm -hmm. they exited jail. And I told them that I had a 100% solution to their problem, that if they just didn't arrest people, right. <laughs> right. they would have a 100% success Absolutely. of people not returning. Absolutely. and. Um, it, it, but it is, it sounds, you know, kind of funny, but it, it's, yeah, true. it's true. It's, it's just it as simple. The second is we need affordable housing, but we have a lot of barriers and restrictions and, and uh, regulations mm -hmm. that impede the development of housing in a way that can be efficient, cost effective, and rapid. Mm -hmm. So we, we've created a problem and we don't do much to fix it. And yeah. I see politicians, everybody sitting around saying they, they give this lip service and say mm -hmm. they're going to address that problem, but they haven't. Mm -hmm. And and no, I was just going to say I think that like the tackling word is is important because I think that we're tackling really hard justice issues. Mm -hmm. You know, like the war on drugs, like Mark was talking about with decriminalization, and I think with the Center of Harm Reduction is tackling the stigma against addiction, which we don't do, and that the whole purpose, our part of the purpose of the center. Is, is creating that safe environment and working with people that are actively using substances and having a space for them to come to be safe. Where our continuum of care focuses on the, la the latter part, which is abstinence. And if you're ready to get sobriety, then we'll help you. And in other countries, they do a lot more innovative um, interventions that are more public health driven, like Mark was talking about, that like safer consumption sites so that really will tackle these issues from a whole different level and tackling the housing crisis and tackling access to care 
you know, how do we really do that better? Yeah, don't get me started about that issue. It's not a war on drugs, it's a war on drug users. Yeah. We attack individuals, we don't attack a problem. And it, we've historically done that, and then it's disenfranchised and messed over a population that uh, uh, just have ended up in jail. Yeah, Tell me about your shirt. Generations. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your shirt. Oh, I love drug users, yeah. yeah. That's the, uh, the uh, mantra of our organization. Uh, yeah, we, we like to talk about um, drug use in a healthy way. It is what okay. it is. I, okay. I don't view it as anything else other than and some people like to eat hamburgers, some people like to use mm -hmm. drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're problematic. And my doctor doesn't yell at me for eating Snicker bars, even, you know, it, it potentially has all sorts of health consequences. But for some reason, we, we um, uh, say a lot of stuff about what people should or shouldn't do. And, so philosophically, homeless health care just um, has an affinity to help people, and, yeah. and drug use is no just labels. one of those. No labels, you got it. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. No I want you to expound on the safe consumption sites. I'm a little jealous because I didn't get to go, right? Mm -hmm. They sent a few of my coworkers to... Copenhagen, Denmark. Copenhagen. We have a we have a partnership. Yes. yes. We are partners with uh, the men's home. It's a really cool site in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, right in downtown. Mm -hmm. And they address the problem differently there. They have an open drug market, believe it or not. They allow, they have decriminalized uh, cocaine and heroin mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. And so they take a public health strategy to, um, to address that problem. They, they allow people to, uh, in a consumption room, they call it a drug consumption room, but it's a safe injection mm -hmm. facility where people are allowed to come in and inject heroin in front of a public health nurse and uh, be watched. And uh, they also allow pretty radical thinking here, people to bring in uh, powder cocaine and make it into crack. And Imagine that. They, Yikes. Yeah, and they mm -hmm. observe them as well. and. What it allows for is people to get help when they need it, to uh, decide to address that issue when they're ready. And in a public health way, nobody dies. Mm -hmm. Everybody's taken care of. And the community, is, it's right downtown in the community. Right. It's this, imagine if we had in the center of Bunker Hill, right. one mm -hmm. of those consumption sites. That's where it's located in Denmark, in the Copenhagen, right in the center of the city. And for a number of reasons, I, I found that to be just absolutely remarkable, but the, the safety piece, okay. you know, you know how many people, um, addicts uh, that we lose, that lose their lives mm -hmm. because they're addicted. You know what I mean? They're, they're in bad places. They're, they're getting killed. They're, right. you know, getting, shooting up with battery acid. You, you understand what I'm saying? But safe consumption sites. And, um... I know a lot of my friends are going to be like, really, Frida? Because I, you know, I got clean and sober, and, and it was like, sit down and shut up. You don't know nothing, right? Listen to what I say, you know, that 12-step <laughs> kind of stuff, right? But um, this is just, it, 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 it's just remarkable. I don't know. How yeah, I, I think, the, well, there. there's a lot of people entering it from different reasons. There are a, a whole, whole assortment of people that use drugs and decide to stop for varying reasons, but mm -hmm. not everybody, not everybody. can. not They can. Right. And so what do you do with somebody when, when they decide to continue to use? Well, you help them and help them use safely, safely. and protect their health and stay alive mm -hmm. so that when they're ready to stop, yeah. if they are, we can actually then go to work. Amber, you, I know you have thoughts about this. I, I, mm -hmm. You're working on a program for us in Skid Row where we're modifying or, or enhancing, uh, restructuring our program. Yeah, yeah. So at our Center for Harm Reduction, um, we are just creating, so one of the beautiful things when I was able to go to Copenhagen um, is that they have a common, they call it the commons area. And it's mm -hmm. just a place where people come and chill out after they use the drug consumption room. Um, they have what they have chill beds where they can take naps. Mm -hmm. um, they have food available. Um, they have they do have a shower on site. We're not going to be able to do that just yet, but right. hopefully when um, if we when we relocate, we'll be able to add that component to it. But it's really again just boiling it down to the basics. Mm -hmm. And 
um, kind of how do we keep people there? Mm -hmm. um, one of the nice things that I really took away from Copenhagen is that, and, and we do a pretty good job of it here too, um, but it's like we don't want clients to be exited from our services because that happens to them so often throughout our system. So our strategy is more how do we keep them indoors? How do we keep them safe? How do mm -hmm. we, and that takes, it's kind of called, called low threshold programming. So mm -hmm. you're like um, working with very um, different types of behaviors and, and you know, and managing those behaviors and, and doing different um, crisis de-escalation skills and different things like that to really just try to keep them inside mm -hmm. um, and maintain a safe environment for all. Um, but we're very excited about it because we just, we feel that building these connection points um, is one key thing to just planting those seeds and then if people, and it's also kind of creating that more on-demand um, type of access to services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times there's facilities that aren't, aren't available or they don't have when they do want help in a different way, um, they have to wait till the next morning or they have to wait, you know, for a later time. And so how do we build a, a system that can better bridge that gap? Yeah. So we're well, excited. And, you know, our problem is methamphetamine in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yeah. It's meth. I wish it was crack, truthfully. I think if we could you know, mm. import crack back into mm. Los Angeles, and <laughs> right, <laughs> I know no. it sounds it's odd, but right, yeah, right, yeah, right. yeah, you go to sleep and you wake up the next day, and, and typically on a, a drug like, not that you don't have other types of problems with mm. people that mm. don't sleep. It's a lot, it has a lot to do with folks that aren't sleeping, but the severity of the types of problems, definitely mental health problems yeah. with meth are so extreme that it, it's a challenge. We, we have a challenge in front of us at Homeless mm. Healthcare to address the, the, mm. sort of the meth issue. That, that drug is a beast. Yeah. We got a question. Please. For you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Stanley Birch, Birch, Birchett, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, sweetie. Mm -hmm. He says, so he's recommending a safe consumption place for fentanyl, mm -hmm. which is instant death. He says, really? Uh oh. Well, Dante. 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 I, I think. Well, but huh? on one end, I would say that, believe it or not, there are strategies you can do. Let's let's assume somebody is going to use fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So, what strategy do you use mm -hmm. to ensure that this yeah. person? Well, you don't use alone. You have naloxone available. Right there. Where you could reverse the overdose, and mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, fentanyl is the big problem with overdose in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. and uh, But having naloxone available, yes, it can reverse that overdose. Yes, it does. And we pass out those kits, people. So Stanley, I hope that answered your question and you got some clarity. Please, can I just ask, or um, actually add to that too, I think the key thing with safe consumption rooms is actually in Copenhagen, they've done a lot of data on this and there's been zero overdoses. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, even with mm -hmm. the fentanyl, they don't have, experience as much fentanyl over there, but um, part of the reason why safer consumption sites are so important is because you keep um, people inside using inside Absolutely. so you can respond quicker and as what Mark is saying, mm -hmm. you're not, they're not using alone. Right. So then not only are staff there to respond, but the other clients that are using the facility are there to respond. So the likelihood of people dying from fentanyl would actually decrease. Exactly. We would hope. Wow. <laughs> so there you have it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What is your viewpoint, Dante? Well, I think we're trying to do this really quick. Yeah. Right. Um, my question is the one thing you said earlier um, about just recognizing these communities, these encampments, is how would you go about regulating these encampments at the same time? While policing is the issue, you know, we don't want people to get arrested, how do you regulate things like sexual assault or, you know, just bad things that happen in communities? Well, I think the good thing about Los Angeles, because we have so many strategies that are in place right now, given the, the funding that was made available through the, the initiatives, we have Triple H and, and H, mm -hmm. yeah. and that there, there are a lot of strategies that address those type of issues in the encampment. So I, I do think it's a, a, a triple or quadruple prong approach to where I'm saying just make the sites um, a good public health site, so you're addressing some of the public health problems, but you have these other type of problems that still need to be addressed, where outreach workers need to engage all the encampments, and they need to target them, and they are right now, and we need to just keep uh, moving forward like we are with the strategies. Um, 
to address some of those uh, issues that may occur. It is, I, I wouldn't say it's common uh, what you raise, but it does happen. Huh? Yeah, like I'm not saying, yeah. but in any community, you know what I mean? In yeah. every community, there's problems. There's mm -hmm. problematic people. There's things that happen. So, yeah, I, I think it's really cool the work that you guys are doing and just the, the changing the idea of how we look at addiction. Like we didn't mm -hmm. come in here the other week mm -hmm. and changing how we looked at criminals and how we view right, those criminals. Right. And I think that's really important is just to stop judging people. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, right. You know, if you smoke weed, you doing the same amount of drugs realistically that that homeless person is doing. It's just a different, it's just a different thing, and you have a different support system. It's totally, it's, to, it's all about your support system. So yeah, I think what y'all are doing is really cool. Thank you, thank you. But you, you do raise a question though that comes up quite often. It, that is the question of the neighbors have. If you're living there, your kids might be walking down the street. Want to mm -hmm. make sure there isn't any type of a serious issue. But I do think it, yeah, there, there's a solution to all these these issues. Just gotta put our heads down. Yes, Angie, please come. Quick question. Come on up. Okay, here's my mic. Basically, I just wanted to know, I'm sorry. I just wanted to know if you could kind of talk about prevention, prevention before a person goes into um, a shelter or before they go out into the encampments because maybe they are a paycheck away from homelessness or what have you. Are there resources or access to resources for people who are at that point where they're about to go into a shelter or encampment? You asked a great question. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually, and I missed it when we talked about, um, we didn't really describe the types of folks that are homeless, mm -hmm. um, but that is actually occurring. Uh, I would uh, say families are in that situation. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few resources for families, but we do have families that are still finding themselves um, uh, experiencing homelessness. But uh, th those resources are much better for families. So we do target, I think, the, uh, for lack of a better word, the lower line fruit of, of folks that are homeless because it's easier to address. Mm -hmm. And uh, the strategy is that on the prevention side, try to prevent it from happening. And then on the, on the flip, we tend to work with the flip because the greatest percentage of people are single adults. Mm -hmm. no, there's no offender buts about it, mm. and but that can't discount uh, from preventing people from entering the encampments or that kind of situation. So our, our yeah, our strategies need to address it. A great question. We really should devote as many resources as we can to folks that are just a paycheck away, the mm -hmm. folks that might need eviction prevention, to folks that just might need a little bit of help and. There, there have been some strategies. One of them is rapid rehousing, yeah. where they're putting people up in a shorter stay permanent housing. It's not permanent for the rest of their life. It's, it's a strategy that's saying they just need maybe a year of, mm -hmm. of that kind of support. But mm -hmm. um, Amber, what, what's your thought on mm -hmm. that? No, that is a very good question. I think that, yeah, as a system, we're definitely always in the intervention phase mm -hmm. and just trying to put out the fire mm -hmm. and one of, the biggest concern that we always talk about at, at homeless healthcare is like, but what are we doing to stop it, mm -hmm. right? Or how are we gonna prevent it from happening? Because we see a lot of generational homelessness starting to happen yeah. too. Um, and and so we do, as a system, we need to do better. I think we have um, a workforce um, component that really needs to be addressed. Um, more equitable wages, you know, where people, that'll help so people are actually getting paid better and hopefully won't be paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. you know. Um, are living paycheck to paycheck, which puts, puts them at risk for losing their, their housing. Um, but I think there's also a diversion program in addition to the rapid rehousing that's been somewhat successful that helps people get reconnected with family members maybe in other states. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit more flexible funding um, to pay for plane tickets and things like that. Um, but, but it's limited right now, and, and, and as Mark pointed out, it definitely does focus a lot more on families than it does individuals um, or young adults, too. That's been yeah, popular for, for Tay. Mm -hmm. So it's an area that we need to continue to grow and strengthen in our system, for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Tay. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, too, Angie. Mm -hmm. So Mark and Amber and everybody, what we do here is we're going to take a break. Take a at the, break. Yeah, we take a little bit of a break at the hour so you can kind of regroup and in your throat and all that jazz and then turn it over to Dante. He always gives me some good little music. And we'll be back here in the Poetry of Justice show with Jackie Ray Phyllis on yikesradio.com and Accelerated Radio.